Hi guys, welcome back to the channel for another video. Today's video is a bit of a throwback old school style what Mia did next video. Haven't done one of these for years where I used to ask you guys questions about eating disorders, recovery, awareness, but particularly stereotypes and the stigma surrounding eating disorders. I really enjoyed that content for a few reasons. One, it really solidified us as a community, even when we were like a tiny little speck and I miss those days and being able to essentially talk to everyone one-on-one, -on -one, but it really brought us a lot closer in part because you told me it was validating to have a safe place to come and talk about how damaging or annoying uh, some of these misconceptions are about eating disorders and the personal impact that it had on your recovery. Now, as somebody who is working in the field professionally for the last two and a half years and working with clients on their recovery, it's important for me to stay plugged into what your experiences truly are. And by extension of that, I hope that resources like this can be helpful for treatment team members, loved ones, partners, carers, just to, yeah, maybe be able to approach this as sensitively and appropriately as possible. So I jumped over onto Instagram and asked you guys, what are the most annoying myths or misconceptions about eating disorders? And I have never scrolled so much in my entire life. There were so many responses. I think I sprained a finger. It was coming through so quickly from the second. I mean, you jump on my stories pretty quickly, but this was so fast. There are obviously a lot of double ups because these are really common experiences. Another reason why I enjoyed making these videos is to assure you guys that you are so not alone in this, uh, that this is really common for people to hold these very unhelpful beliefs. So the first one here, which was very, very popular was weight restoration equals full recovery. This one's particularly damaging in a treatment sense that there is this belief held that the most important thing we can do is to increase somebody's weight. And then we send them back out into the world at a time when they're probably mentally the most compromised and most uncomfortable because we still have an active eating disorder. Those neural pathways have not had enough time to change and certainly haven't caught up with the change the body has gone through. And then they are put in scenarios where people are making assumptions that they are healed and it's when they're most likely to be triggered. And that's where we see a lot of relapses happening that that uh, work on the mental side of things. Given it's a mental illness, probably most of the work is gonna be done in this region. Uh, they just haven't had the chance to do that yet. And yet they're being treated as if they're all fine now. And that it's okay to comment on how they look and how much weight they've gained and how happy everyone is for them uh, is, yeah, just a recipe for disaster. And one of the ways that I really combated it, even though it's not a foolproof plan is to always remind yourself of intention versus how it's being received. The person's intention is being run through your eating disorder filter. So you're probably not hearing it the way that they intend it. Uh, but absolutely that is a tricky one. The next one is a personal annoyance for me too, guys, <laughs> that you can never fully recover from a treatment perspective. I just think this limits people so much. If you do not tell somebody there is a destination on the map, they will not keep walking and they may just end up like camping out somewhere quite dangerous and pretty mediocre for the rest of their lives. Let's tell them that the five star hotel is just a few blocks away and it's all paid for. And there's someone there to give them a foot rub. That's pretty much the comparison between quasi recovery or remission and full recovery. Uh, so I think it's important just to give people the option. It's not to say that everyone will fully recover or that you have to, but at least keep an open mind to it. This is so tricky because I know that there is a lot of discourse out there about people saying full recovery is not possible. And they're not saying full recovery is not possible for them. There are blanket statements being made that full recovery is just not possible. And I personally find that quite hurtful. And I know that other people from an advocacy perspective and a treatment perspective who are self-disclosing, fully recovered coaches, therapists, dietitians, etc., find that there is only one way to interpret a statement like that, which is to say that we are being dishonest or that we are not being totally honest. And with all the work that you do to fully recover, uh, that's a little bit insulting. I just wish people would stop because you do not get to decide whether or not somebody is fully recovered. And for those individuals, I just hope for them that they can reach a place where they at least open their minds to the fact that it's possible uh, because it's so worth doing and having a crack at. The next one was very popular, that it's all about wanting to be skinny. This 
is still really widely held as far as beliefs go, that it's really just about the physical, that it's just about wanting to look a certain way. And the extended kind of message from that is that it's a vain or superficial choice. Well, it's not a choice, it's an illness, just like you can't choose cancer and you can't choose pneumonia, you can't choose an eating disorder. The brain is an organ, this is an illness which exists within the brain, and this is just how it expresses that illness. You know it's sick because it's coming through in your personality, in your behaviours, in your tone, in your headspace. That is how the brain expresses that it's not well. And for that reason alone, it is much, much, much more complicated than wanting to be skinny. There's a whole host of reasons why people develop eating disorders. Just wanting to be skinny isn't one of them. Wanting to be skinny is more like a symptom. It's how it's expressing that it's present, right? But usually there's a whole host of much more complicated factors going on. Maybe it's trauma. Maybe it's a genetic predisposition. Maybe they were bullied. Maybe there's been a major life event. Maybe it's anxiety and depression. It can be one of those things or a combination of a whole lot of them. Wanting to be skinny, again, is not a contributor. It's sort of the result of the eating disorder. So yes, I had a fixation on wanting to be skinny, but that was because I hated myself and I thought I had no value and no worth and wasn't lovable. So I had to make at least that part of me somewhat acceptable. So again, symptom, not really the underlying stuff. Another popular one, those with eating disorders hate food. Many of us love it. We just consider that love wrong completely even before i had an eating disorder i had a belief that people with particularly anorexia didn't enjoy food so not true in fact for a lot of us the fixation on food and the belief that we can't be trusted with it that we can't have permission to have total food freedom leads to the intense rigidity and rules so very often you'll find people who recover and they're foodies like i'm a foodie i love to cook i love to try new foods uh, and that's what i was like before my eating disorder so absolutely we are not you know haters of food. I'm food's number one fangirl. <laughs> this was a big one. Only skinny girls have eating disorders. Only teens have eating disorders. I think in some spaces, this one's getting better with social media. It has been such a powerhouse. I know with eating disorders, social media can be a garbage fire, but in other ways, it's been such an incredible force with blowing open the spectrum of what eating disorders look like and what those experiences are individually by, you know, diagnosis, by race, by gender, by sexuality. There's so many representations now which are making it possible to see that, in fact, the stereotype is absolutely not the majority because anorexia is only 3 to 4% of the eating disorder sufferer population and binge eating disorder is 47%. So obviously that stereotype could not be further from the truth. The two places where we do still see a lot of that discourse and representation is in the media not a lot of guesses for why they do that because it guarantees clicks. There's salacious headlines. There are, you know, very graphic images of people who are underweight uh, and that's essentially going to sell more newspapers. Even though I know for a fact that they have been told what is responsible reporting and what isn't, they still, funnily enough, choose to do the unhelpful thing. Also in treatment spaces, like with GPs, I know that it's improving. Butterfly Foundation has done, you know, great work in securing funding for GPs in Australia to be uh, sort of upskilled, retrained to be able to spot and respond to eating disorder sufferers more appropriately. But that is also where it's a big problem where you have bodies being pathologized and people being told you couldn't possibly have an eating disorder because you don't appear to have an eating disorder based on that three to 4% <laughs> apparently of the monopoly and what it looks like. Uh, but it is improving. And I am particularly proud of the Butterfly Foundation who have gone through just a whirlwind of incredible change over the last couple of years to become more inclusive and to really represent beyond that stereotype. You're eating, so you're okay. Yes, I'm eating, but there is a war going on in my head. I think this is similar to the, you've weight restored, everything's fine, that people don't see the inner turmoil that's going on with making those efforts to 
recover and that every mouthful, every bowl, every plate, every whatever for a period of time is a real challenge and a real battle. And to then have people commenting in a way that makes the eating disorder freak out can really throw us off course. There's something that I did when I went into recovery, which was just purely instinct. I asked everyone in my inner circle who knew about my recovery, not a lot of people did, half the internet did, but <laughs> not people I knew personally for a long time, uh, I asked them not to comment on my food and not to comment on my appearance unless something that we had pre-agreed was going on, like clearly behaviors were present or they were worried about what was happening to me physically. But as long as I seem to be on track, please don't comment on my food, please don't comment on my appearance because there is an eating disorder present and it will turn the most shiny, beautiful unicorn level compliment into just the depths of hell kind of insult. So just taking all of that off the table and removing any possibility that anything's gonna be misinterpreted just helps to clear out some of that noise and remove, you know, at least some triggers. You're out recovering in a diet culture, body beauty standard obsessed world. So just trying to reduce the impact of that as much as possible with the people closest to you uh, and explaining to them why that's important and that it's not forever, right? You'll strengthen your healthy self neural pathways. You'll get to a point where you can filter that stuff in and out where someone can compliment you and you just hear the compliment. What a concept. Um, but yeah, just taking it off the table in the meantime can be really helpful. Our eating disorder is something we choose to have. Absolutely. Hear this one all the time. I spend a lot of time with clients and their loved ones. So very often they'll say, can you speak to my, you know, my mom or my, you know, best friend or my sister or, you know, my partner and just give them some insight into what's going on because they can't understand why I can't just make a different choice. And that is so understandable. If you have not lived in this mindset, I can totally understand why it feels impossible to comprehend and what it looks like from the outside. But again, I think we have to remember that those behaviors, those actions, those patterns are a reflection and a symptom rather than what's actually going on, right? What's actually going on is a really, really severe mental illness and you are witnessing the symptoms. That is not a choice. We cannot choose eating disorders just like we can't choose physical illnesses. I couldn't choose to develop endometriosis. Nobody chooses a bad heart or a chronic illness just as you cannot choose a mental illness. Uh, so people need to be given as much grace and compassion and patience and support as they would be if it were a physical illness. That you can tell when someone has one, it is mental and there's a lot of secrecy. Absolutely. I think when we look at those statistics about what we expect eating disorders to look like and how they actually present and what that percentage of sufferer population is, it just goes to show that regardless of what we're talking about, just looking at someone cannot tell you an awful lot about their health. And it is not safe to make assumptions either on one hand that they do have an eating disorder or on the other hand that they don't. To be open, to be compassionate, uh, that if you think that somebody might be struggling with an eating disorder, to by no means pressure them, but to just let them know that when they're ready, that you're ready to be a support to them. Uh, but no, please never just make an assumption that somebody has an eating disorder. But yes, very, very, very common belief that we can, again, pathologize people based on what they look like. And I would just ask everyone to please go and read Health at Every Size as an extension of that conversation about not being able to determine someone's health status based on what they look like. So guys, they were the most common and popular sort of myths and misconceptions about eating disorders. Thank you so much for joining me for this video. Come and find me on Instagram and Twitter under what me did next. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Much love. Take care. Bye.